nice. So we'll just dive right in. Um, no the the process we're talking about today is is going to be limited to doc registration. This is a brand new process. Um, it was a little funky in that it uh, it took effect during COVID, so it really didn't take effect when it took effect and it, there's definitely some bugs to iron out in the process but this is really the first time I've been doing this for a long time 30 years and this is really the first time that DES is really cooperating with a homeowner so this process is definitely doable by a homeowner you do not need to hire an engineer an architect or watermark marine to do this process so we're pretty excited about it don't get excited about DES stuff very often but um, we're going to go through it I'll give you some little tips and tricks and I think it's a great resource for a seller because you can establish that the doc is then permitted or essentially registered. So um, we'll dive in when Adam's ready. Oh, here we go. Um, just so everyone, I'm, first of all, I saw Mr. Cronin on here. I just wanna say I'm not an attorney and I'm not a realtor, but um, I've been doing this a long time and I've been involved at just about every level of um, wetlands, either from a rulemaking perspective or uh, from a legislative perspective. So I think I know what I'm talking about. It is very difficult to uh, deal with specific questions in a, in a forum like this, but at the end, my, uh, my email's there. So if you have a question, you're welcome to shoot me an email if it's a specific thing to um, something that, uh, that you're doing. Uh, one thing I will point out, there was a, uh, there is a new Doc Rules Review Committee that just wrapped up last fall and we've made some huge changes to how docs will be regulated in New Hampshire. And it hasn't gone anywhere yet, those recommendations, but it was a legislative committee. So I'm hoping that that would move forward probably next year in the legislative session. And what those changes are is basically be allowed a lot more leeway in what you can build. So for right now, you pretty much need to build a structure perpendicular to shore, but you might on a smaller lake or pond, you may not care about boating and boat slips. You may want to deck over the water. So hopefully those changes will move forward. We have made the recommendation to the legislature. So that'll be uh, maybe a, 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 a presentation for next year. So that would be fantastic. Yeah. So we, we hear from people constantly with questions and these, these are kind of the top questions and, and you can read through them. But the one we're gonna talk about today is people will call, especially if they're thinking about selling and they'll say, hey, you know, I, I bought this house and the docs are grandfathered and uh, so they're perfectly legal. Well, people can say that and I'll get into it in another slide uh, in a little bit, but the, the grandfathering thing has been a real thorn in our side for a long time and you had to to prove the dock was there, uh, maybe if it was seasonal of 1978, if it was permanent 1969. And these properties have changed hands so many times, it's very, very difficult to do that. So um, the, we, we get these questions that you see in black here constantly, but what we're talking about today really is specific to, um, is my dock legal and, and, and you know, can we call it permitted? Um, and we'll talk a bit, little bit more about what a legal structure is. You can, you can roll to the next slide. Evan. All right, so the first question is, do I need a permit to do something? So hopefully everybody has the basics of this, but basically the Wetlands Bureau is what we're talking about here. So that's docks, beaches, boat lifts, anything on the bank or in the water. And then related to that is the shoreland program. So that's everything from the water line back 250 feet. And in that same zone, you might need a DES subsurface permit. That would be a septic system or something like that, or site assessment you'd be familiar with as a realtor. And then the alteration of terrain. We haven't done too many of those. Alteration of terrain is usually 100,000 square feet. But if you're in the shoreland zone, it drops to 50,000. So if you go through Wolf Bar Bay, there's a couple of projects over there, uh, a couple of projects on Sunapee where we've worked on. But we don't do alteration of terrain too much. But what we're talking about today is the Wetlands Bureau. So it's a little messy because the jurisdiction overlaps. So wetlands uh, extends up to the top of the bank. So on the top of this slide, that line is where the change in slope is. And then out towards the lake is wetlands. And shoreland is from the full lake line in, so the bottom of the slide. So you can see there's an overlap there. And you don't need two permits. In that overlap zone, you just need a wetlands permit, but you still need to meet the shoreland. Uh, components of that permit. What we're talking about here today is dock registration. You're not allowed to do any work on the bank. You can replace a set of stairs or rebuild something that doesn't require any impact to the bank. But 
specifically under dock registration. We're only talking about docking structures. So beaches um, would not be included, dredging's not included, boat lifts are not included, it's just the docking structures. So hopefully that makes sense. That's a little, little messy. So the biggest thing we ask people to do is, you know, where do you start? Or what they ask us, how can we find out what we have? So this is the DES website. Um, I think only the government could come up with a web address that's that long, but basically DES, um, the wetlands program is under the Land Resource Management Bureau. So the website is LRM, which is Land Resource Management, and it's the one-stop permitting program. So that's how they got that long uh, name for their website. But this is a way to search. And so I, on the next page, I'll show you something. But basically, you don't need to type everything in. Type, type less in um, is more. So under owner last name, in the example I'm going to show you, I type my last name name in and then uh, my folks had a camp for years in Laconia so I typed in the site address was Laconia or site town and this is my folks permit history for their for their camp um, I will tell you if you're looking for something specific um, I would also if you don't find anything also search with known spelling errors um, in my case you might put Godwin um, you might uh, spell something wrong or like if it has a Stein, E and an I, you might swap the E and the I backwards. If it was put into the DES database wrong, it won't show up. It has to be typed in wrong. So, um, so a lot of times what you're going to get is, is a result that says X unknown. Um, but uh, Adam, if you can scroll down, this is, this is an example of what you're going to see. And this is mine, so I don't feel bad sharing this. Everything in this video, everything in this presentation today is public record. So I'm not giving away any secrets, but you can scroll down there and you can see that we had a shoreland permit. We had a permit by notification for dock repairs. We had some expedited permits. Um, what's interesting is my dad fought a 25 year battle with DES over his canopy and none of that shows up here, but this is the basic permit history for this property. And you could click on the details and get more information if you needed it, but pretty straightforward for someone to look at that. Unfortunately, if there's no permit history or it's a, spelling error or it's X unknown, you can't get any more from this. So you can scroll down at them. Next place to try is NewHampshireDeeds.com. Um, if the permit, uh, if there was a permit issued for that property it, in the last probably 10 to 20 years, most likely that permit is registered at the registry deeds. That's not a perfect solution. A lot of permits have not been registered even though they were supposed to be. And then town database and building files. If uh, Moultonboro, for example, a lot of times Moultonboro, right on their website, you can click on the property, look, click on documents and actually see permits. Um, Sunapee has a pretty good website. Sunapee has a wonderful database in their basement of all kinds of old pictures around the lake. Um, so any, anything like that, you can find maybe an old permit or at least some information that might help you get through this process. So that's really the place to start. Okay, Adam. So basically what we're dealing with is, is RSA 482A. That's what establishes the power of the Wetlands Bureau. And basically any work in the water or on the bank will require a wetlands permit. This dock registration process is not a permit. It's just permission to do the work. So it's exempted in the statute and it's allowed specifically for repairs in kind. So if you have to ask a question like, can we add something? No, you can't add anything. So as soon as you start asking that question, you're going to have to switch to a different type of permit application. There's very few things you can do without a permit, but you can repair a structure out of the water. You can rake leaves, you can put a swim raft in, and you can remove exotic plants within limits. Um, so that's all you can do without a permit. These are the types of permits. Again, we're not going to go into these today, but just so you're, the, you're aware of them. The standard permit is the highest one. That's the most difficult with a 50-day time limit. A minimum expedited, uh, supposed to be signed by the Conservation Commission before you send it in. We hardly ever use that one. Uh, permit by notification used to be our go-to for repairs. And that's a 25-day clock or a 10-day clock. And then seasonal dock notification is another thing. It's not really a permit. You just mail in a one-page form. You don't even need a drawing. But that's limited to one dock on a, on a vacant piece of property. One thing to point out here, the, the, the um, asterisk at the bottom is there's a Supreme Court case and an alteration of train program permit from last year that means that DES has to formally address Natural Heritage Bureau and Fish and Game comments. 
and they are overwhelmed with permit requests right now. So we're seeing anywhere from two to six weeks of delay to file a permit right now to file anything that requires NHB review. So you need to plan that into your, there's no time limits, they, they can take forever and you can't send your permit in until you have those comments. So that's a little aside, it's not part of doc registration, but it's, it's a real stagnation to the permit process. So. Um, so what we're talking about today is the doc registration permit. It's not a permit, it's called a process. Um, and it was, uh, the statute took effect in January of 21. They had the documents out maybe mid last summer and it's going gangbusters now. I, one of the really weird things is they do not put these permits on their, on their database. So I have no idea how many have been filed. Um, we have one number 21 and one number 17 that are from this winter. So they haven't done too many of them yet, but we'll go through how this works. It's a 10 day turnaround, very quick permit with no review. They are really just looking for completeness and all they're gonna do is accept it or reject it. So it's one bite at the apple. It's gotta be complete. We're gonna talk about the little trick, tricks of the trade here in the next slides, but, but it's limited to the repair of legal docking structures. We're gonna talk about what that means, but you cannot use this if you have a dwelling over water, which is a boathouse with living quarters. And if it involves the creation or maintenance of made land, um, I've been doing this over 30 years. I think I've only done four, four to six made land projects. They're very complicated. The governor's council has to sign off and they, they're not gonna let you do that as a quickie permit process. Dwellings over water uh, are a different section of the statute, RSA 42A26. And if you have a dwelling over water, you really need to read A26 and they're not gonna let you repair it or do anything to it under this process. But, but for regular docks and boathouses and, and breakwaters and things, this is right up your alley, easy to do. It's a two page form, which they say you can do it online, but again, um, typical government, you can do it online, but all you do is submit it online. You have to print it out and send in your $200. So we're not doing it online. Um, the, the homeowner, the owner of the property has to sign it. So we're just mailing them in. And Adam has a link he can send you if anybody needs one of these forms, but they're also available on the DES website. The biggest change for us in the doc business is the grandfathering date has changed to January 1st, 2000. DES does not care what happened on the lake before 2000. That is a massive change, a uh, big game changer for what we do. Another big game changer is no abutter notice is required. You don't need permission. You don't need to notice them. If you're within your, your rights, then you can go ahead and fix your doc. There's no limits on what you can fix here. You could repair a post, you could rebuild the whole dock, you could rebuild cribs, replace pilings. It doesn't matter. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Another thing that's good now is no NHB. So you don't have to send in a Natural Heritage Bureau request. So you don't need to address their concerns or Fish and Games concerns. Please understand you don't get a permit. All you do is get a letter saying they've accepted your repair and you're allowed to repair your dock in kind. And we'll, we'll see an example of the letter in a few minutes. You have to post your numbers in three inch letters across the front of your dock or the structure. That's a bit of a challenge. That's something we're going to have to work on. Um, anybody that's familiar with Rattlesnake Island or the town of Alton, Alton's asked everybody on the water to put their address on the end of their dock for 911 purposes. Now they want people to put the, the dock registration number there. So we are doing it, but there might be some challenges or some changes to that coming, coming forward. And then this is valid for five years and you can okay. renew it at the end of five years. Yep. Go ahead, Adam. It's fine. All right. So what do you need to do? This is extremely important. These are reviewed by one person at the state. That person over time could be an administrative assistant. It could be an intern, could be a temp. It has to be entirely filled out. You cannot leave a single box unfilled out. You have to fill out everything, even if you're right, not applicable. The owner must sign it. So because permits run with the land and tax map and lot numbers, the owner must sign this permit. You can't say, oh, I rent a slip and I'm gonna have the dock repaired and I'm gonna sign it. No, the owner of the land must sign it or they're gonna reject it. There's a $200 fee. And this is, if it's rejected, you don't get your fee back. So that's why we'll go again through some tricks of the trade here. You need to prove it's a legal structure, which means you either have an old permit or it's grandfathered and that it's been in the same size, location, and configuration since January 1st, 2000. Size, location, and configuration are the three things that DS holds us to on all permitting, and that's what the same standard they're gonna hold us to here, except with the change to January 1st, so that's, that's pretty big. 
the plans of the docking structures must be at the scale of one to 10, one to 20, or one to 30. But I'm gonna talk more about that because if you had an old survey or something, you could put that in there and just draw the dock to that scale. Again, this permit is only authorizing repair and kind of a docking structure. So they wanna see where it is on your property and such, but they're not gonna care about where your beach is exactly, that sort of stuff. So we'll talk more about that in, a, in an example here in a few minutes. Um, and then dated photographs. We're gonna talk about how to take photographs. It's possible you could be rejected because you didn't take photographs to tell the story. Um, I used to kid around years ago, I, I grew up in the boat business. We had a Polaroid camera back then. We used to take damaged out, out drive pictures. People would hit a rock and the insurance company would come in and they would always kid with us that we had one Polaroid of a damaged out drive. And we just kept reusing it because we didn't show the boat in the picture. So that's what DES is looking for. Is this really this property? Is this what you're trying to do? So we'll talk more about that in some examples here. Hey, Paul, ahead, there's, a, there's a question about okay. uh, the lake level. Is that different like on Winnie and, and Squam? Yep, good question. So the full lake levels, which you have to show on the plans, I'll talk about that in a minute, but that is published published at DES. It's called the list of public waters, and you can find the elevation for um, impounded waters. If there are some funky ones that, that are private dams, um, Lake Nubanusit out in Nelson, it's really hard to find what the limit, what the legal elevation of that is. Um, but Lake Winnipesaukee is 504.32, for example. Yep. And that's, we'll have to show that on a plan, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. So the top half of this slide is what we used to have to deal with. Um, it's very difficult to prove that your dock was there before 1969. If it's a seasonal dock, it was 1978. That's all gone now. We don't have to deal with that. If you have old information, that's great. I put it in the permit, all the ammo helps, but the date now changes to January 1st, 2000. So the cool thing is that kind of brings in Google Earth photographs to this process, which definitely would, did not happen back to 78. So we'll show, show, show you some examples of that and how easy this process is. I'm giving you a ton of information quickly, but I'm gonna go through some examples and show you how easy this really is if you adhere to those guidelines of complete application. So, okay, Adam. All right, so are there any old plans or, or permits available? Um, this, is a, this is an actual old permit from, um, uh, from Governor's Island, and I think it was from the uh, 80s, if I'm not mistaken. This is a good example of what you see in an old permit application. On the right is the plan that was submitted, and in the same permit application was the photograph on the left. So you can see that they didn't, they didn't draw everything because they didn't show half of the stuff that's there. But these two things in combination are great because you can see that there's a crank up dock there. You can see a huge breakwater. You can see a building on the water. So this combined with the plan is really good evidence that this was there in 1986, I think is this permit. And so it, it's just proof. So I would put both of these in the permit application for a dock registration. What the heck? Hey, there it is in 1986. We beat 2000 and, and we can go from there. So that, that is, uh, I found those records in the town of Guilford um, tax records. So it's a resource to find this stuff. And it's, that's pretty hard to, to rebut any of that information. So um, this photograph I found, this is an example of a 1998 photograph. Um, this is uh, Weir's Boulevard. So this is um, Route 3. So the DPW takes a lot of pictures, aerial pictures over the years. I could have gone back further, but this predated uh, 2000. Um, it doesn't really show scale or anything, but you can clearly see those four docks there. And I, on the south side of those docks, I'm sorry, the north side, you can see the gazebos. So it just shows that they were there. And then I found some other plans and things to go with this. But if you were the owner of that U-shaped dock that's right in the middle of the picture, that's uh, Poggy Space Sporting Goods, or was when I was a kid. You can see that U-shaped dock pretty clearly and know that it's a pretty good sized dock. Um, so this is great ammo to put in there for grandfather reference. Um, different towns have different levels of this stuff. And sometimes you can find these on Google Earth. But um, DES, um, DOT has resources that follow the highways. So some of Route 28, um, 109, um, you know, Route 3 in this example, all would have some resources available to, to find an old photo if, you're, if your homeowner doesn't have anything. So this is one of my favorite photos. It's same family happened to own the property uh, into, they still own it today, but one of their um, uncles was a commercial diver. So in 1942, the fellow that I deal with now is in the diving helmet. That's, that's him as a teenager. And um, they, 
you know, this doesn't show any scale or anything, but you can clearly see that that's a permanent crib dock. You can see the cribbing underneath. You can see how many people are on the dock. So, it, you know, we're not really had, held to a courtroom level of evidence here. If you can convince DES the dock was there and it's grandfathered, in this case, no brainer, that, that's a permanent dock. And, and uh, you know, the other thing was this one was in the same family. So it was pretty easy to convince DES that uh, that was an example. But family photos, um, reun reunion photos, grandma's birthday you know grandma was 80 in this picture and here's the dock in whatever year so any of that that a homeowner might have i know properties have transferred so much that it's not always easy to find somebody that's been around that long but in this case this was a pretty great photo to have in the in an evidence situation for grandfathering so and when we're selling properties we, we always ask the question of the owners when we have buyers to say hey you know, do you have any old family photos that show the, the waterfront and things like that? So for the realtors that are on it, it's a good idea to, to capture those as you're going through. And it, it might, you might not need to do anything with it, but just to have that information available, it could be important for a seller. Yep. Um, this is Winnipesaukee, Winnipesaukee Yacht Club in Guilford. Um, I'm a member there and I got a permit to rebuild the docks. And this was a photo from 1957. Uh, you can scale some sizes in this photo, but um, we actually, in this case, got affidavits from the people in the picture. Some of them are still members. And so it, it's obvious that this doc is still there. Um, but we obtained some written affidavits. I do not believe DES would accept an affidavit on its own under this process. But in conjunction with some pictures, I think it's pretty strong evidence. Um, and the affidavits we get mostly don't come from a yacht club, but they might come from a neighbor that's been there a long time. Or, you know, I grew up I grew up next door and I walked on that dock or water skied with the kids that grew up there. And then some other evidence to go with that affidavit. I don't think an affidavit alone would do it, but um, it's that combination of evidence. This was an interesting one because, you know, Weir's Beach really isn't a permit we would send in for grandfathering, but we were doing some work on the pier. And this is a Google Earth image from 98. So you can see the Winnipesaukee Pier on the lower right. And then I noticed that those docks south, of, I'm sorry, north of that, there's a big L dock there. There's a big duck, deck over the water and there's kind of an F-shaped dock. Those would be great examples of just using this Google Earth image, which is dated 1998. And that they're going to show you that this was grandfathered. So this would be wonderful evidence. Um, I used it for a different reason. I'll show you some pictures I took later. But um, that's the type of thing you're looking for. And I, I'm still going to keep hounding on this. A couple different forms of evidence and a couple different pictures and a couple different plans is a great way to just go right through this process with no headaches. Um, this is an example of a Google Earth image. The U doc you can see in the middle of the two big finger piers. Can't, can't dispute that. And in this case, we had a plan from the 80s. And I'll show you that in a minute. But this combined with that plan, there's no doubt those docks were there before January 1st, 2000. Again, there's no scale in this picture, but you can get a sense that that boathouse that the cursor's on, that's still there today. That U-shaped dock is still there today. So with the combined with the plan, this, would, this, this was readily accepted under the dock registration process. So I talked about photos earlier. You kind of want to show everything in a photo. What I mean by that is this is the Winnipesaukee Pier. These two pictures show you everything that's south of this building. And I'm not zoomed in too much, and I'm not zoomed out too far. You can see the fingers, you can see the pilings, you can see the, the docks, you can see the boathouse over the, the dance hall. Um, so that's the type of photo you want to send in. You don't want to zoom in on one piling and say, we're going to straighten this piling. And you know my analogy of using the one damaged outdrive picture, DS has no idea what that piling is. So real easy to take a picture of the whole thing, and say, we're going to rebuild this. If the dock was damaged, you'd want to have a good plan to go with this and say, hey, that finger pier got ripped off by the ice in early April. But tell a story with your pictures. This is just an example of how simple it is to do that by stepping back a little bit and not so far back, you, you can't tell anything. But this is pretty straightforward um, stuff in the pictures. This is an actual set of pictures from a permit. I put two pictures on a page. They're not too big and they're not too small. Under the standard process, you're required to do two pictures per page. Um, this is an old boathouse up on Squam. We got this easily approved um, under the dock registration. It was the first one that I ever did last year. Um, and I'll show you some other stuff we sent in with it. But um, pretty easy to tell how big that dock is. Pretty easy to tell how tall the boathouse is. 
Um, I took a couple pictures of the cribbing to show that it's permanent dock and it's crib, but this is just a very easy way to take a picture and um, showing DES, hey, these, this is, this is uh, when I, I took the pictures on June 2021, and this is what was on site. So you can scroll down. There. We'll add to the thing. Here's an old plan um, for a, a project in Wolfboro. This was a site plan that I did. I was still doing shoreland permits at the time. Unfortunately, I don't have time to do them anymore. But if you look in the top right, I took the time to draw the breakwater and docks. Now it's not part of what this permit went in for, but if you needed to prove this, there's the dock and breakwater right there. Pretty straightforward. Not the reason this plan was drawn, but very easily this could be used for dock registration. There's the breakwater, there's the dock predates 2000, good to go. So is maybe it this look at- water that you drew or is it this yeah, one over here? Uh, the one on the right there, yeah. So that's on the property. It wasn't part of what, you know, you can see, I think that says no work proposed, but it's on the plans. Clearly it's uh, it's there and you could use this plan under dock registration to, to get it. You'd want to draw a plan just showing the dimensions, but you can see the breakwater and dock on this permit. So I would look for old site plans, uh, anything that might be in a building file, you might be able to find old, maybe an old septic plan. We're going to see that in a minute. Um, you might see the you might see the docks on there and be able to use that as an old plan. The U doc I showed you, um, the Google Earth photo from 1998. This is a this is a, a survey dated 1998. You can clearly see the dock. It's a survey, so it has scale. This this will go through or did go through dock registration in one day. We send in old pictures, we send in current pictures, and we send in this plan with a current plan. Easy, easy permit. Um, never had a permit so easy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Winnipesaukee Yacht Club. It's uh, drawn to scale, everything's labeled. I'm embarrassed to say, I, I would never would have put a plan in with 13, eight and a half inches on it, but that's what we did here. Um, you know, plus or minus measurements are fine. And that's what DES is looking for. That's fully labeled, uh, shows the crib support, there's some pilings under there too. Pretty straightforward. What's on site? We proved it's old. That's all they need. You don't need a surveyor. You can a homeowner could write on top of this and describe dimensions or plans or whatever. So very easy to find permits for this particular process. So I mean that that brings up a good point. Having the crib supports at labeled in here, you might not think of that, right? Yeah, and I'll show you another example of um, labeling the support structure. This is that old boathouse I showed you up on Squam Lake. We had a survey from 1989, so I included that in the permit application. I found a great photo from 1940 of Mrs. Bulkley standing there in her Sunday best, I guess. And then we drew a detailed drawing of the boathouse, which shows the crib sizes, crib locations, uh, proximity to the property line, shows the sizes of the dock. So these three things, this permit was approved in one day. It's not even approved, it's just accepted because they can't argue with what was there. Um, in this particular case, this property is never transferred. It's uh, been inherited from the day it was sold, whenever that was in the 1700s, I think. So, um, but this is wonderful evidence to prove that boathouse is there. DS is not going to not going to harp on any of this. They're just going to give you the accepted letter. There's the detailed plan. You can see I show the full lake shoreline to to reference Adam's questions earlier. That bold line approximate full lake shoreline. I show the docking structure dimensions. I show the type seasonal permit. I show the cribbing. There's no breakwater in this case. I show the support structure details, location, size, and footprint. This has a boathouse on it. It's not a dwelling over water. So in the lower left in the drawing, we're showing the size of the boathouse, the height of the boathouse. If you had a seasonal canopy, you'd want to show the height. And this drawing is at one, one inch equals 20 feet. So it meets their standard for one by 10, one to 20 or one to 30. They're just gonna, this thing's gonna fly right through. A homeowner is more than capable of doing a drawing at this level. It can be a hand sketch. It doesn't have to be in CAD like this. But. So this is what you actually get. As I said, you do not get a permit application, a permit. Um, you're gonna get a letter. And I just blanked out whose this was, but this is um, DR number 0017. Um, that's all you get. You get a thing that says you have to put three inch letter, uh, three inch high uh, dock, registration number on the end of your dock, you have to be able to see it. it, has to face out towards the lake so that they can see it from a boat. And it can't be obscured by a water craft normally. The one thing that's really fuzzy here is in the case of us ripping out a dock and demoing it and replacing it, I don't know how you put the numbers on the end of the dock while you're working there. 
that's one of the things we've got to work on with DES. I'm going to seek uh, or ask that these numbers be reduced to two inches tall. Uh, you Three inches tall is the size of a boat registration, and I think it looks silly on the end of a dock. So maybe two inches is enough because DES could pull up your dock and read that. Um, so, and in Alton, we've got an issue with the 911. So um, we're working on that. This is a new process, but um, pretty, pretty easy. And it's, this is a, such a good thing. So um, this is really important. You're not, you're not absolved of any other things that you'd normally have to do. So if it's a simple dock repair, not a big deal, but if it's a big crib dock project and you're going to demo that crib and rip it out and replace everything, you're still held to the standards you would be under a normal permit. So what I mean by that is turbidity controls, siltation controls, silt curtains, whatever, all that stuff still has, you can't degrade water quality. So it's important to note that the owner is on the hook for this. Um, contractor would get in trouble too, but you're not, this doesn't make the, the job any easier or cheaper or less complicated. The homeowner's held to the standard that they would be under a normal permit application. So that is, that's right in the letter they get back, the homeowner, but it's critical that the, any contractors understand that this isn't a free for all. This is somebody, you know, if you, I'm frustrated sometimes because I don't think, you know, we, we spend about 50 or 60 grand a year on turbidity curtain and throw it all away. I don't think most of our competitors even own any, but it's required on these projects. So depending on what's going on, you, you're held to that standard. So hopefully that makes sense to me. There are, believe it or not, some good resources uh, that you can use. Uh, a realtor can use it or a buyer or seller, and, and DES has, has some things you can go search. This particular example is a wetlands and shoreland um, type thing, so just something uh, to be aware of. There is big differences between tidal waters and, and inland waters, but there's a few little differences on inland waters, but basically everything I've told you would uh, take Take, would also apply to smaller lakes. We kind of focused on the bigger lakes here. Um, and one really cool function of this dock registration is if you have a seasonal dock and uh, there's a lot of challenges on Ossipy, on Spindle Point on Ossipy, um, and uh, you could go in and get a seasonal dock registration and you'd, you'd have that dock established as registered with DES. So um, there are some good resources available. Uh, final slide is just how to get in touch with me if anybody has a specific question. I'm glad to answer any questions here uh, in this forum, but if you have doc specific questions or site specific questions, uh, it's hard to answer those in a group forum. But um, I hope that makes sense to everybody. This process is, it's a huge game changer for us and for homeowners, I think. So if you want to come off, off mute and, and ask a question or... Um specific uh, to the, the doc registration process or maybe in general on the, the shoreland protection stuff. Go ahead, Karen. Um, would you recommend if, even if you don't necessarily need any repairs done, the homeowner starting the process of getting registered? I think it's a good idea, especially if they're thinking about being a seller, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're not thinking right now, but they would. The reason is when they do their own research, first of all, they find something they don't like, or they find something illegal, they don't have to send it in. But it's worth the legwork to figure that out because if, they're, if they've got a problem, they're gonna to wanna to know that as a seller. And if they don't have a problem, they should get it registered because if they have ice damage or they decide to sell, that, that's registered, it's perfect. DES knows what they have, it's a no brainer. Um, so you know, it doesn't get registered with the registered deed, so it's not quite as powerful as a permit, but it's, it's registered in that there's a database with those drawings at DES now. So it's as good as a permit. Yep. Alexander asks, does a seasonal item added to a permanent dock require a new permit? If it's anything added, would anything in the water requires a permit. So a seasonal boat lift, a seasonal canopy, all those things do need a permit. Um, however, that might qualify under the shoreland, I'm sorry, the, the, um, what's called permit by notification, which is a quick permit process. Um, you can scroll up to that if you want to add in this list of the permit types. Under the PBN, you could do a 14 by 30 single seasonal canopy, or you could do a single boat lift or two jet ski lifts. So that, that does need a permit, but it's the quicker of these processes um, called PBN, and uh, it's either a 25 or 10 day turnaround. If you go to the DES website under PBN, they list these very specific things that qualify for that, and um, you can see that listed right there on their website. 
So talk about the, the five year, like they have a five year renewal and that just, it seems a little bit weird. Okay. So two things about the renewal. One is if you didn't do anything different, you can just renew it and pay your extra $200 and you get your doc registration for five more years. The reason it's renewable is um, I tried to get lifetime permitting when we were lobbying for this, but they didn't go for it, but they are worried about creep. So one of the things is there's a lot of permits from the eighties that if you looked at those properties today, have a lot more things added. Uh, that question about seasonal things was good because people, you know, add, added things over the years. So they don't want people to creep their projects. But um, if you were to get a permit in the middle, let's say you had a single dock and you have a dock registration, so you're all set to repair it. But in the next five years, you want to add another dock and you have enough frontage to do that. You, you might benefit from re-registering your you're renewing your seasonal in a couple of years and, and adding that second dock under that registration renewal, because then you'd be good to go if you had ice damage. So in the places that kind of hang out in space, um, I think we all know where those are, right? Um, you know, a lot of the, the area of Wolfboro Neck out by Parker Island, those places kind of get hit a lot. Um, the, uh, the broad side of Rattlesnake Island, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, right by the Governor's Island Clubhouse, the beach areas along there. Those are kind of traditional ice damage areas. It's great to have doc notification, uh, doc registration current at all times, because then we don't need to get a permit. It's already there. So if we need to do one piling repair to a full rebuild because of ice damage, I think there is a benefit to having it registered. Everybody on here is an expert at dog registration. That's awesome. <laughs> hey, Adam, Paul, I have a question for you. Hey, John, if, go ahead. So, so you did our dog probably about four or five years ago, and at the time we couldn't get grandfathered because of the, the you know, lack of information. But given the new timelines, if I were to do that dog today, I'd probably get that grandfathered. Is it possible to step back and apply the current rules to something that was permitted three or four years ago? I think that'd be a great test. I would want to have an attorney file that permit, but I think that would be a great <laughs> test of this um, grandfathering because this grandfathering date is buried in the um, RSA that, that it, that's uh, mentioned. I just can't read it on the bottom of the screen. It was in an earlier slide, I think. I actually referenced the statute where it is, um, but it's buried in there. But the DS has told us consistently that, oh, it's changing throughout our everything has changed to December, uh, January 1st, 2000. So um, anyway, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't be comfortable saying yes, John, but I think that that would be a good test of the new thing to say, you know, we could have done this permit three years ago and I, I meet those rules. I'd want to have some good evidence there, which I think you do, if I'm not mistaken. I do. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Paul. I think, I think that'd be a good test. Okay. Good question. That's a great question, yeah. So Deb, you had a, a question about the, what if you had a, a 2.5 year old permanent dock that used to be seasonal, what happens if you don't register the dock? Well, I might be familiar with that particular dock. So <laughs> I believe that- um, Deb's smiling. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the dock registration process is entirely voluntary. So this, is, this does not require anyone to do anything. So if people said, I don't want, you know, there are people that say this all the time, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get a permit because I don't want DS to know what I have or they have known illegal things or they've done something intentional that is not really cool. Then there's no reason for them to file. So they don't need to do it. In the case uh, Deb's talking about, I believe her permit is still valid. So there's no reason to do dock registration anyway, if you have a valid permit, because if you had an ice damage or something, you could fix the dock under the valid permit. This is more geared towards those people that wanna establish their dock grandfathering and might wanna be a preemptive strike to something that um, would be uh, potentially ice damaged. And they're just gonna have the permit in their pocket for next year or five years from now. So I saw a question pop up, but I missed it. So Gina's trying to get somebody there. I have a client that I can't find anyone to put in their seasonal doc. Any suggestions? <laughs> None at all. None at all. We, um, we take care of about 500 docs every year 
We dumped, I think, 150 people over this winter. I felt terrible doing it. What a great piece of salesmanship to write someone a letter and say, we can't take care of your doc anymore. But we're, we have such short staff that we can't possibly take care of those docs anymore. And um, the in and out pipe docs, nobody wants to do them anymore. And we can't, we have no subcontractors and we have no one to recommend. So I don't know is the answer. It's very frustrating right now, but. Sounds like a good business to get in. Yeah, I keep thinking if I could find a, you know, 22, it's a young man's game, you know, 20, 22 year old, 24 year old young person that wanted to work hard, they could make a living and probably not have to work all winter because um, the rates are high enough now you could actually make a pretty good living at it. But it's, it's physical work. It's not, it's not easy. Uh, there's a question. Jumping up at that, so. <laughs> <laughs> Still no, still no. Um, we will get a link out to the recorded. I have everyone that's registered. So um, those who join a little bit late or whatever, we'll get you the full, full presentation. Any other uh, shoreland protection? You know, Paul did write the, help write the, the current rules that are in place and things like that. So we got another message. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. If anybody has a, a question or specific thing, just shoot me an email and I'll do my best to get back to you. And can I send this, the, the presentation out to everyone as well? Sure. All right, because that, that has Paul's information at the end. So thank you, everybody, for joining and uh, enjoy the weekend. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you.